So hopefully we all eat food every day and we all drink every day. And so our sense of taste is something that we could easily take for granted. So you've probably never stopped to think why we all have different favourite foods, why we all taste food differently. And you've probably never stopped to think why we even have a sense of taste at all. Taste is the gatekeeper for what goes in our mouths, and that is a pretty important job. If something tastes good, then it encourages us to eat it. Um, if it tastes bad, then that's probably a sign that it shouldn't go in our mouths. That sounds pretty simple, but the problem is our sense of taste developed in a food environment that's very different to the one that we live in today. So we have umami, which is the generic savoury flavour, and sweet, and those are tastes that tell us that a food is full of energy and that we should eat it. It makes sense that we want to eat foods that are full of energy, because if something's full of energy, that means when food isn't available, we'll have an energy store and that's going to help us survive. So that's an evolutionary advantage. Also salt, we like the taste of a little bit of salt because salt is important for all our bodily functions. We're basically a, a seawater organism. But these days, food is readily available. High energy food, high salt food. And most of us, including me, are enjoying those tastes more than is good for us. That's contributing to problems with overweight, obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, lifestyle diseases. Unfortunately, food manufacturers are completely happy to take advantage of the fact that we like high energy and salty foods because taste is a big determinant of what we want to buy. Salt and sugar are also natural preservatives, so they make processed foods last longer and they cover up any unpleasant flavours in the food. Bitter and sour, they're aversive tastes. They tell us that we probably shouldn't be eating those foods. Spoilt foods are sour um, and poisons, poisonous plants, are generally bitter. It's a really unfortunate quirk of coevolution that the healthier a plant is, the more bitter and poisonous it's going to taste. Because the foods that are good for us in small amounts uh, would kill us if we actually had them in too high amounts. Again, the food industry likes to exploit this and breed foods uh, that are going to be lower in these healthy, bitter compounds and higher in the, the sweet compounds. So think about the difference between your uh, sweet corn and your regular corn. Makes it tastier, makes you more likely to buy it, but it's not really doing us any favours in the long term because it's giving us less of the potentially healthy, bitter compounds and more of the sugars. So some of us taste uh, sugar more acutely than others. Some of us have a sweet tooth and like sweet foods. Others think that sugar is sickly sweet and they don't like too much of it. So why do we all taste that differently? Unless you're an identical twin, and I am an identical twin by the way, but for the rest of you who aren't identical twins, you're all genetically unique. You have your own versions of the genes that help you taste foods and flavours. For example, some of you won't be able to tell the difference between diet soda and regular soda. Others can definitely tell when they've got a Diet Coke and they think it's sickly sweet or it might have a, an unpleasant bitter aftertaste. Those of you who get that have a particularly acute version of the taste receptors that detect bitter compounds and instead of sweet you get bitter. Coriander. Coriander is divisive. You either like coriander or you think it tastes like soap or dirt. If you think it tastes like soap or dirt, you're not uncultured. It is a dysfunctional version, a slightly slight change in the gene for some of the volatile compounds that are in coriander that give it its distinctive flavour. Your tongue detects it wrong and it thinks you're eating soap. These differences are what I study. Differences in taste receptors are important in determining what we like to eat, and what we like to eat is very important in determining our health. Using your genes, we can group you into non-tasters, tasters, and super-tasters. Non-tasters eat more, weigh more, drink more alcohol. Theory behind that is the less you taste, the more you need to enjoy those tastes to get the same signal to your brain to say that you've had them. 
On the flip side, tasters and super tasters are more likely to dislike healthy bit of vegetables. So this is important in determining our risks of overweight and obesity, uh, cancers and cardiovascular disease. But while your genes do direct what you like to eat, they're not the end of the story. You can train your taste based on repeated exposure. As I said, I'm an identical twin, but me and my identical twin don't like the same foods. One of us is vegetarian, the other isn't. One of us loves tomatoes, one of us hates tomatoes. So you can train your taste. An obvious example for those who aren't identical twins um, is cultural differences. So if you're raised with a particular cuisine, then you become accustomed to it. A really stark example is the Southeast Asian fruit called the durian. The durian, if you're raised with it, is sweet and lovely and perfectly acceptable. If you're not raised with it, first time you meet it, there's a good chance it's going to taste and smell like rotting flesh and be absolutely unpalatable. It's actually been banned um, to eat on airlines because of this. It's not just your upbringing. You can change your taste starting from now. Beer is a really good example. No matter how much you like beer right now, I guarantee you did not have your first swig of beer and think this is tasty and delicious. The bitterness of beer over time becomes palatable and even desirable because your brain learns to associate it with the good feeling that beer gives you. So if you can learn to like beer, you can learn to like vegetables. <laughs> You just have to give yourself repeat exposures without negative consequences in order to train your palate. If you do need to get more veggies in your diet, and 95% of you do need to get more veggies in your diet, try adding salt or butter to your vegetables because that's going to block the bitter flavours that make them unpleasant. Over time, you can take the salt and the fat out and still enjoy that taste. So you can work your way to vegetables slowly. The really cool thing is this training starts well before you realise it. It actually starts in the womb. So when the fetus is in the amniotic fluid, the flavours from the foods that mum eats get into the amniotic fluid and the fetus actually swallows that. The fetus's sense of taste is developed well before it's ever going to eat and drink on its own. The training continues after you're born with the flavours getting into your mum's breast milk as well. So this is a way of training baby to learn what foods are in the environment and what foods are safe for mum to eat. We do know this has an impact because there's studies that show that if we tell mums to uh, eat lots or refrain from eating a particular food, uh, that that will have an impact on how much the, the baby will accept it. So, for example, there's a study where they tell mums to either eat lots of carrots or eat no carrots while they're pregnant or breastfeeding, and then they offer a carrot-based cereal to the babies afterwards. The babies whose mums ate lots of carrots are more accepting of the carrot-based product. There's also studies that show that uh, the, if children are breastfed, then breastfed children eat more foods and are more accepting of trying new foods uh, when they're toddlers. It's really important that you are patient with your kids while you're doing this taste training. When you're little, your sense of taste is very acute because let's face it, little kids will literally put anything in their mouths. So our sense of taste when we're young is highly acute to help protect us against those potential poisons. So next time your kid refuses to eat their vegetables and acts like they taste like poison, don't be cranky with them, because to them, they really do taste like poison. You need to give them repeat small exposures without negative consequences for them to learn that vegetables are not actually poisonous and to train their taste. As we age, our sense of taste declines, particularly in old age, it starts to drop off. And it's been proposed that looking at the availability of the stem cells that replaced our taste and smell receptors is an indicator of how old we're going to live, how long we're going to live. This can be a challenge in the elderly because if you're tasting food less, you're going to be less inclined to eat and you're going to add more salt and more fat and unhealthy things to your food to make it taste good. This is a challenge for ageing well into old age. 
We can add spices and herbs to food in nursing homes to make it taste better without compromising the nutritional quality, um, and this can help improve the situation. Now, I'm going to finish with something that you probably think you know about taste but don't. So you've probably all seen in primary school or high school or even university the tongue map where you've got the different sections for each of your tastes. Yeah, that's a lie. It's not a thing. It was put in a textbook mistranslated from a German publication in 1901 and 30 years later we figured out that it was wrong, but we've been teaching ever since. So it's taken a little while for the textbooks to catch up. You actually have all your taste receptors all over your tongue. But we've recently discovered it's not just your tongue. You actually have taste receptors almost all over your body. So from your mouth all the way down your gastrointestinal tract to your intestines, um, on, in your lungs, on your pancreas, in your kidneys, everywhere you can think of you've got taste receptors. Now obviously they're not going to be involved in consciously detecting food, um, but we are starting to uncover roles for them in um, appetite and hormone control, gut motility and uh, detecting things like microbes. The action and function of these receptors and their interactions with our diet and our environment is what I study, and that's the new wave of taste research. This field could shed some light on some very complex health conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, all the big problems of the world, and hopefully offer some treatment strategies. We might be able to design products that target those receptors and either block them or artificially stimulate them, um, or we could give people dietary advice that's specific to their taste genes. So, next time you eat, or next time you're judging someone for what they like to eat, I really hope you stop and think about why we taste and why we all taste differently. And I really want you to remember that it's not too late to train your taste buds to appreciate a healthy diet. Thank you.